Welcome to an episode of the award-winning podcast, Art Insiders New York. My name is Anders Holst. The theme of the podcast is New York, with a focus on behind-the-scenes conversations with fascinating people who are making an impact in the world of art, design, and architecture. Evan Snyderman and Seisty Myers, owners and co-founders of the R and Company Gallery, have managed to transform their passion for design into one of the world's finest design galleries. With an obsession for seeking deeper beauty of design objects and a philosophy based on teamwork, collaboration, and an innovative cross-disciplinary approach, they have defined a full-blown global trade called collectible design. In this interview, we talk about their artistic and entrepreneurial journey from the B Team, a performance-based glass artist collaborative group via the wild west of the Chelsea flea market to exploring design in Brazil and Scandinavia. They share the story of how an unexpected sale of Marcel Brewer commissioned furniture laid the foundation of the gallery we know today. R & Company exhibits historic designers as well as 22 contemporary artists creating unique works, limited editions and site-specific installations. The present exhibition at 64 White Street includes Katie Stout, a young Brazilian designer, Zanin de Zanin, and Jeff Zimmerman. Collectible design, that is what we're going to discuss uh, today. How would you define that? Uh, what is collectible design for you? What we've spent our entire careers as dealers trying to create is a market for this niche inside of the bigger design marketplace, let's say. Collectible design is really a subcategory of the bigger design um, you know, world, which is, of course, enormous and includes everything from fashion to cars to furniture. Um, we have sort of carved out over the course of the last 15, 20 years uh, this idea of collecting design the way you would collect contemporary art or fine art. Uh, where the objects of design become part of your collection. And that's the term or where that term sort of comes from. When we take on a person, it's about representing them and their ideas more than just asking for work to sell. It's about trying to figure out how we can, um, if, if they're alive, how to achieve the goals and other desires or things that they're dreaming for. Um, most people that we represent that are uh, living um, want the idea of uh, some kind of perpetuity as well, um, to know that their work is gonna sort of live past them somewhere in significance. Um, along the way, then we would have to find the clientele mm. to be able to achieve that uh, going down the road and then look at some of their other dreams and desires about, well, how do we make a career out of this person, with this person, for this person, and grow with them and be able to grow together? I see. So here we are at your wonderful gallery space. We're actually on Franklin Street. Now we moved from uh, White Street, where you have a fantastic uh, gallery on the ground floor and two subterranean levels, uh, complete with a bright and airy 40-foot atrium that floods all the floors with light. Now, uh, why are you in Tribeca? Tribeca kind of came to us uh, by way of a little bit of luck. Uh, we were shown a space that happened to be uh, next door to, there were a couple of other furniture galleries in the neighborhood at the time. Mm -hmm. There was what a, a space that most people don't even know of now or remember called Totem, which was one of the very first design, contemporary design galleries, really, in New York. And it was across the street from where we are right now. Uh, and they used to host these massive parties that we would go to <laughs> on the street, like literally closing down Franklin Street with hundreds of people. Um, so we were drawn, I guess, partly to that idea of, the, of that, but also the physical spaces, which were larger than everywhere else we were looking, and at the time, much more affordable. Yeah. One of the great things this space afforded us to be able to do was it, one, it has basically every different height of ceiling that one of our clients would have. Mm -hmm. So s subconsciously they would register as something familiar when walking in. Um, uh, galleries can also be intimidating, right? And we're supposed to be selling you things to live with and to collect. We wanted to exhibit design like fine art dealers um, showed art. And we couldn't figure out why if the secondary market of the Christie's and Sotheby's at the time 
Um, Phillips didn't have a design department yet at this time when we were first moving. It was just being put together. Um, we're already selling things for such a dollar amount. Why weren't there more periodicals? Why wasn't the perpetuity there? Why, um, why, wasn't, why weren't other people doing exhibitions on certain other types of people? Yeah. And we moved here knowing that if we did that, we could expand and grow into the idea we had instead of just uh, being able to sell beautiful design objects. Yeah. There were really no exhibitions happening on design at this time. Um, be out, outside of uh, the uh, once in a while a museum show like an Eames show might have been produced by a national museum for instance but beyond that there were no true exhibitions happening but having gone to art school um, Zesty and I both had a sort of different interest and a different approach to running you know quote unquote our shop which is really what it was in the beginning it was a vintage shop mm. and we had bigger aspirations we didn't want to be stuck selling you know, furniture and design on that level. We felt like there was a huge missed opportunity that no one was really, um, you know, pushing that that angle that we're creating exhibitions. So we set out on a mission specifically to find a space where we could produce exhibitions. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, we were already starting to collect certain designers' works, historical at the time. It was all historical in the very beginning. Uh, that were sort of unsung heroes of the modern era. So we went out on our own to different parts of the world looking for these unsung heroes of design uh, to, in order to bring to market and create exhibitions. And within our uh, first year here in this space in Tribeca, we produced three exhibitions with three separate catalogs, um, some of which are still the only catalogs on those designers. We were really excited about the idea of of sharing, you know, these sort of discoveries, and that was our our way to do that. Yeah, um, I've read this wonderful uh, book that you published for your twentieth uh, anniversary, uh, twenty year of discovery, and uh, in there there are some very uh, interesting stories about how you started out. You have a background in glass blowing. You're both artists. We were all both professional glass blowers, and when we were much younger, we also um, to make a living at first. When we couldn't sell enough artwork, we were making glass for other people. Yeah. For other artists. But you also had the, the B team. That was like the, the Blue Man group, if I understand things correctly. Yeah, almost. Could have been. <laughs> yeah. Could have been. Um, <laughs> the B team was formed because um, when the NEA really went through a big round of cutting funding for the arts in America in 89 and 90, um, we thought it would be better to group together as a group of visual artists instead of being singular. And with glass blowing, we were taught the way Evan and I were taught, and the way we do would still make glass is in a team. Mm -hmm. And it's the power of the team and everyone knowing what to do that accomplishes the goals mm -hmm. um, in that kind of setting. So we set out to um, find and seek what was out there. We set out to bridge the gaps between uh, craft and design in the fine arts world, between craft and design in the performance world. We didn't see a difference. Um, what, what, you know, it is all how the product was either presented, used, or owner, how they ended up with it, and who showed it um, was the issue. And we set out to bridge these gaps. It's no different with what we've done with some of the things we have that could really be design or craft today, or could it be fine art? We don't, necess we don't give the answer. Yeah. It's still the same. We just want to push people to think, to create a discourse and discussion. And, and to challenge, I think, the conventions of what it was people thought of as uh, glass blowing, and that was part of what the B team's mission was too. Was to not just we we were we didn't want to make objects. You know, most of the people who produce glass produce objects, and that's how they function as a business. And so, what we discovered was that the material itself was far more interesting than the object when completed, and we wanted to celebrate glass in its sort of raw molten state. So the B team created these very elaborate uh, constructs to produce exhibitions, or not exhibitions, performances um, around molten glass, making machines uh -huh. that would shoot hot glass and we would do performances where we would dance on hot glass uh, with our feet <laughs> on fire and things like that. Nothing, nothing um, dangerous. <laughs> make um, it rain molten glass. All, yeah, all for the sake of, well, you know, you know, pushing the boundaries, but also having fun. And yeah. I think in the end, that is the most important thing uh, about still what we do today. We do it because we enjoy it and because it, it, it ch it's constantly challenging us. We're never, we're never satisfied by what, where we get to in our, in our 
business, we're always looking for how we can continue to sort of grow and change. Yeah. And, and, and since we were talking about a material of glass, the material is supposed to be limitless. Why then what we were surrounded by seemed to be keeping, it kept looking like more and more of the same. Mm. And as more and more of the same came out, it made us wanting to like just push the material and just see what it could do and just and, and experiment. I see the B team coming full circle now too, which is interesting. And I don't know if the B team had an influence on us becoming R, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the sort of letter uh, shortening of a name for a brand, but the way that we started and one of the other members of the B team was of course a man named Jeff Zimmerman, mm -hmm. um, whose lamp is hanging above your head mm -hmm. and behind you. Um, Jeff was the first contemporary artist we set out to represent because up until that point, I think because we were glass makers and we had come from that world, we sort of avoided it on purpose. Yeah. We didn't really want to sell glass. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to be glass dealers or get involved in the glass, you know, collectible glass market or art glass market, which was, uh, the, you know, kind of a, a dying industry in a way. Mm -hmm. um, but Jeff being an artist and not really also having, of course, having the same ethos as us from the B team, not seeing himself as a glass maker, but as a contemporary artist happens to be using glass as a medium the same way you would use paint. Yeah. Um, he was a perfect fit for us to experiment with contemporary design. Which so Evan makes that sound easy, but it's really hard to be the technician and to have ideas that resonate together. Mm -hmm. Most people hire, hire the maestro, right, to do the work for them yeah. because they can't do it. And then the maestro can execute that design for the person that asked. But ask the maestro to make their own artwork, it's normally a disaster. So there's very few people that can actually control a material to these kinds of levels that can also then have ideas that come across in the same way in the final product. So would it be correct to say that uh, the ethos of what you did as the B team, like the focus on teamwork and collaboration and crossing boundaries is sort of part of the DNA of your gallery today? 100%. And there, there yeah. are, the same thing, there are no secrets. We, Back then we needed to get out there to know the people. We had to travel physically because there was no internet, there was no social media like that that would put us together back then. So we physically would go to people to see what was happening. Mm -hmm. We back then, when we had our own social media kit, we used to take a box of slides around with us of people that we thought were making interesting work with the material and also do a slideshow of people from around the world mm -hmm. to show them what was going on because they couldn't see it anywhere else. So how did you move from glass to furniture then? Because you went and uh, started selling mid-century furniture. It happened a little bit by accident. Um, we were both successful in our own careers as glass makers. I were, was showing in galleries and doing quite well and teaching X number of days a week. Um, but had a, a moment where I was moving, for me it was pretty clear. I was moving from Philadelphia to New York and I had been a collector my whole life. Things mm -hmm. from matchbox cars to uh, other random uh, mid-century objects, but nothing of any great value necessarily. But having to rid myself of some of these <laughs> possessions, uh, I set up at a local flea market in the, in the Lower East Side with a friend of mine who was selling vintage clothing. And uh, after a weekend or two of, of that, driving up from Philadelphia with X number of boxes of things and setting up on a table, um, Zesty mentioned one day he had some stuff he'd like to sell. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should get a table together. Mm -hmm. We rented a table there at that flea market. It was at 11th and A in the church parking lot. That was it. And then it, it just came naturally. All of a sudden, we were, but, yeah, you know, was, having these great fun. conversations with people, and 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 it and it was fun, and we were making a couple of extra hundred dollars, and it felt like you know it was liberating. You know, and then it was like fall, so we didn't do anything else. But then we talked over the winter, and this was purely a hobby. I was in the same boat Evan was. I was making. I was very comfortable what I was doing in the galleries I was shown with, and mm -hmm. everything else I was doing. It was. It was. It was good. But we decided in, um, that th that winter, and the way we really form is we both went back to where we came from and scavenged and spent $100 each. Mm -hmm. And that spring, we, this was just a hobby. We set up the table 
um, to start selling again, and it just started to multiply. Um, and literally, that hundred dollars each went to two hundred, went to five hundred, went to a thousand, and things were a dollar, then they were five, then they were a hundred. Um, as and we started to educate ourselves. One of the ways I got more into design was I grew up with mid-century design in my house without ever knowing it. Mm-hmm. So now in one, of, in my, one of my children's bedrooms is um, dressers that my grandfather had bought in the 40s. So it's gone through four generations now that I had in my room as a kid growing up. But I had no idea I grew up around these things until I started to do research. And one day before I moved to New York in the earlier 90s, I, uh, someone came into a gallery I was showing in Boston and so happened to be a dealer and invited me to come visit him in New York, and I did. And he was an incredible dealer of mid-century things. And he ended up trading me for some of my artwork. And mm-hmm. I still have some of those pieces to this day. Mm-hmm. More sentimental reasons, more because I always loved them from the beginning. And um, I used to stay at his house, and he had a giant wall of books. And I could never take a book back to Boston with me, but I could read, go to his house whenever, and take any of the books off the shelf mm-hmm. that I wanted. You know, at this time, there were very few books on mid-century design, which is really what we were starting to become interested in. So very after that first summer and into the fall, we realized you know, we wanted to become a little bit more specialized. And this 1950s modernism was, was very popular. There was, uh, you could still find things in thrift stores and junk shops and even in the trash on occasion. I pulled a several Eames chairs out of the garbage over the course of those first couple of years. And um, there was one... I think, moment, for me at least, which opened my eyes to the idea of this becoming a a sustainable kind of business, which was I had gone back on one of those journeys with our $100, you know, to shop Philly, where I was from, and in Kensington, which is underneath the elevated train, this really run-down, desolate neighborhood, found this little junk shop, and inside I discovered a George Nelson, uh, what's called the asterisk clock. Mm -hmm. Um, Sorry, it was a steering wheel clock. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was $5. And I knew what it was because I had looked through some of these books that we didn't even really own. We had borrowed and um, brought it back to the flea market. And a guy who lived across the street from the flea market saw from his window our clock on the table and (laughs) runs downstairs And, you know, how much is the clock? You know, <laughs> we sold him this clock for a hundred bucks. Yeah. And this was like, wow. This was like, holy smokes. We just sold this clock for a hundred dollars. You know, this was a big deal. And we both went to deliver the clock. That's how big of a deal it was to the guy across yeah. the street. Delivery included. Turned out, you know, he was a furniture kind of picker dealer on the next level up from where we were, obviously much further down, you know, he's been doing it for years, said, well, you know, I have a couple things, maybe I'll give you guys to sell. So he started giving us a couple pieces to sell in the flea market, which we did, of course. And we still know him to this day. He was just at the gallery last week. That's incredible. Yeah, of course. And so like these bonds were really forged that way. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have, I bought a machine age art deco floor lamp one day and I had $300 that day to spend. And I took it back, and this, and this, now we moved up to Chelsea, to the flea market in Chelsea, which was like the big time compared to being on 11th and A. Yeah. You know, unless you were there, you, didn't, you were there like at 4.30 in the morning. The amount of stuff that transacted and the amount of dollars that were being sold was incredible. The amount of objects, paintings, textile, I don't, everything coming out from the last 50 years was maybe at the height of itself before the last gas before the internet takes it over. Oh, is is that what killed the, the flea market concept? No, real estate killed it. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and then the eBay's you could have more access and get to more people. Um, but the, but yes, people put buildings on parking lots, right? Yeah, the real estate yeah. was far too valuable in the yeah. middle of Manhattan for a flea market. And I had spent a hundred bucks on this lamp and thought I was crazy. And we pulled it out of the van at four thirty in the morning and get surrounded by all the pickers. And we sold it like for four hundred dollars. And then I and I still to this day I do not know what I found. I've never seen it in a book. Yeah. I still know the person that bought it from us that probably sold it to the next person five minutes later. And the numbers just escalated to whatever the outcome was. So the Chelsea flea market was, was where we cut our teeth, I think. That's where we learned our trade. That's where we learned so much about the business and about the history of design and all these other things because there were some really great sort of elders there that would 
come around and, you know, the nice ones would tell you a thing or two mm-hmm. about what it is you were selling in your booth or, or ask the right questions or refer you to someone else or to a book or some other thing. So we really spent, um, you know, three hard years, four hard years at that market, yeah. waking up four in the morning, three days a week, um, till 7 p.m., you know, slugging all that stuff in the van, out of the van, loading, unloading three times in a weekend. Uh, but that's where that's where we learned, you know, what, what it is we do. And it also is where we made some of the most lasting friendships from the people we met there. Yeah, when I when I researched this uh, for this interview, there were some stories about you uh, staking out places at two uh, two a.m. in the morning. The, the estate yeah. sales. Yeah, the estate sales was a fun yeah. part of this process, which um, yeah, we we found a way to upend that entire business yeah. um, by just showing up before everyone else, and um, in every random neighborhood within ninety miles of New York City. Neither Evan or I could have realized by being in the Chelsea flea market, who actually was shopping there. And the people we met are still the tastemakers, the leaders of a lot of culture or, and or the wealth in New York City. I think the, the best thing that we've ever brought to this marketplace is um, we knew that presentation was the only thing that mattered in the end if people were gonna be able to recognize us. And so we would set up our flea market booth like an apartment, we'd put a rug on the asphalt. We would do other things. We would stack it up and make it look prettier than um, all these other booths. And that's what got us to stick out. And the people that would come um, would be amazing. And then they all wanted to start to come to see um, everything we had in storage. Because yeah. they all thought we must have had tons of storage. And we were, we were still just, you know, taking every, every dollar we were getting, we were just now flipping into this thing at a multiple, at a rate that was just multiplying. I saw the quote here, Evan's obsession is to always have things in the right order. Did this influence you at the time? Yeah, I, I think that's it, where it started. And I, but I've been that way since I was little. I mean, in my room when I was a kid, I had all my, my Matchbox cars lined up perfectly on the shelves and all yeah. the pocket knives and I displayed them all. Like it's always been about display for me. And I think that also comes from going to art school and knowing how to present certain things, how to talk about things. And so using all those talents. But yeah, even at that early flea markets, we do these very elaborate, you know, psych, you know, scenographies of this little uh, 10 by 10 foot space mm. or 20 foot by 20 foot space if we could afford a double booth. And that said, it, it's true. It did set us apart. It, we made a lot of uh, friends and we also made a bunch of enemies there. Because we were sort of, in a way, we weren't following the rules. You know, the rules were you, you were a picker or you were a flea market person. Yeah. You know, the, the two didn't really mix. We were both. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we would pick the market and then sell at the market. And um, often falling in between where you could, you know, because a lot of these dealers are there to pick things and then sell them to the dealers in Soho. And we were too expensive for them to pick from us but still cheap enough for the dealers in Soho to buy from us. So we sort of cut out the middleman uh, and made it our own niche again. And um, so that, that worked well for us. But it was, in ve- it was probably the most competitive part of the market that ever we'll experience. You must be very nostalgic when you think back at that, uh, at that time in your life. And all I wish the there stories. was more... Have, have you ever thought about writing oh, your memoirs about I wish that there was time? more photos. I wish someone would write the book because yeah. you know, there, there's some really inc- unbelievable stories of that yeah, and time. And the people that were... And it's the people, we, some of them we can't, you know... It was everybody. And then you had the different sets of people then would start to stagger throughout, throughout the day. And it was, it was the fabric of New York City. And it became excessively popular right when we... When, we did it right before the height of it was at the, probably its crescendo of the whole thing, and it was and it was it was actually really fun and amazing. And we would we would buy stuff, we would buy stuff, and we wouldn't we would buy like big things, and we we and if we didn't sell big things, we wouldn't be able to put them back in the truck at the end of the day. We would we'd have to make two trips back and forth to Brooklyn then to be able to get it out of there, which never happened. And then we started to raise our prices, and then we knew we'd found something in a different way, and that's what gets us to open 
our first little place in Brooklyn that gets us to Tribeca. Yeah, but you're, you're true entrepreneurs because I read a story here about the Marcel Brewer's first project where you bought something and you good, could yeah. buy it and then sell it uh, well, under the provision that you didn't have to pay rent in the meantime because then it, the, the deal would have been off, right? Well, yeah. That deal was the deal that made us, actually. That's yeah. why we're here. That's that, that one singular deal basically solidified our and company because we we were um you know at the at the flea market and in brooklyn we had the shop in brooklyn we were still doing the flea market because we couldn't sustain ourselves on just the the market and we were still doing the glass blowing b team was still at that point at its height we were traveling to japan and we were we were doing so many different things but uh <clears throat> i had a friend in philly that i used to buy from a picker who um called me one day sent me a picture, maybe it was a Polaroid, I don't remember, of a chair by Marcel Breuer. And he had a chair for sale um, and a desk. And tells me the story. It's from Bryn Mawr College, Breuer's first public commission in America, 1934. Um, he had sold a similar chair 10 years prior something like that at auction and sold for ten thousand dollars and we had we had the record we knew this was real which is like an enormous it's, amount of it money. was the only time the chair had ever been like seen yeah. right and it's and it's a plywood chair very simple chair and it's dorm room chair it's a dorm room furniture from this dormitory that Breuer designed for Bryn Mawr College all women's college outside of Philadelphia um, so we thought okay and he offers us this desk and chair for I think it was $10,000. It was a lot of money, way more money than we had, obviously, at the time, to buy something. But here's the proof. It sold for this much 10 years ago. What could it be worth now? What was? So we started doing a little research. Um, I thought, well, I'll just call Bryn Mawr College and see like, you know, how many of these were made. Maybe somebody there can help me a little bit. Because there's, no, you know, there's, there's one mention of it in the Marcel Breuer book, yeah. a black and white photo, this early, early um, book, which we found the reference to. And I get a hold of someone there, and they referred me to the admissions office who referred me to the, uh, you know, the physical plant people or something like that. And eventually I got on the phone with someone, and they said, oh, well, you know, we're having an auction this weekend. Um, and for, it's for alumni only, but if you're interested, come on down, sure. It's like, well, I, you know, so we rented a truck. And we drove down there, and, we had, and, it, we and lo and behold, the, 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 the entire dormitory of furniture is up for auction. And I wish to this day I had a damn camera with me. Oh my god! Because there was a gymnasium, yeah, the basketball court, mm -hmm. all the furniture lined up, like in rows, all of it. And, and the deal was they they told us, well, we already gave a set to the Philadelphia Museum of Art and to this other museum, right? So now, we're, now our heads are even more buzzing because museums are taking the work, <laughs> right? And, and, and they say, well, the alumni has to bid, their alumni takes first. And we're like, well, what do you do after the alumni? They're like, well, we have to get rid of it. So we're like, well, can we buy it? And they're like, sure. You, there was like six people there. Yeah. And they're like, and you can buy it for whatever the highest price is at auction or something. But no, almost nobody, none of the alumni bid on it. And so we had taken all of the money we'd saved up to move to Manhattan from Brooklyn, all of it, which, was, which wasn't quite enough for the first and last so, security so, deposit. So wait, one step back from that is that we had found this space in Tribeca. This space that we're in now, yeah. yeah. And we had done a handshake deal with the owner mm -hmm. who said, I like you guys, you can have it, here's the deal, you know, I need six months up front and, you know, whatever the depo security deposit, all this stuff. We, we said, we'll take it, but we didn't have a dime. We didn't have any, we had barely enough for like one month's rent yeah. to sign this contract. But then all this just sort of happened. This deal came up while we were in this negotiation with the landlord. So we take all of our money, all of it, and we buy all of the Breuer furniture. Yeah, and, all of it. and we get to pick out, we went and picked out the best pieces in the gymnasium one by one. Yeah. And we still couldn't fit it all in the truck because we were buying whole sets because there was a dresser, a mirror, a bookcase, a chair, and a desk. And I don't know how many sets we ended up buying, 12, 15 sets? Yeah, full complete sets. And then, and then we, we sold them off one by one. We sent one to Christie's, we sent one to Sotheby's, we sent one we to, sold we sold to one museums. or two to oh, yeah. museum. We sold a set to a really great collector of ours. And 
And that money from those sales, we signed the contract on this space. That's so interesting, uh, fascinating, actually. How 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 should I say it? It seems like you had. Uh, some kind of a blessing over this collaboration here since everything went your way. Well, it's true, but the other underlying reality is, yes, there's luck at being in the right place at the right time, but also it's the idea of never uh, accepting a no or never being afraid to ask the question. We could have easily just said, okay, let's buy this desk and chair for $10,000. But being curious and thoughtful enough to go a little deeper, to do a little bit more work, yeah. to do a little bit more research, that's what the difference is. I think it's so fascinating because you, you, you were selling furniture, but then you sort of took a deeper interest in what you were doing. Um, you mentioned in, in some interview uh, the craft of an object, the technology used in its creation, uh, and the idea behind the design. You talk about deeper beauty that you were interested in. And of course, the way you displayed your furniture and you working with the history and, and the story of it. And then, of course, there was this international uh, expansion where you uh, traveled the, the world and uh, bought books. Uh, the Brazilian adventure, for instance, I found uh, in, incredibly interesting. Well, it was the same thing. This is all happening because before the Internet... The only way for us to have knowledge was to buy, basically, and try to find these antiquarian books or pamphlets. Um, And if we were going to have more clients, they were going to say, well, how do you know this is a such and such if they didn't have a book themselves? So we just innocently started to buy books to do research, and it became the most important thing to us. And then we would sit around and have discussions like, oh, Alvar Aalto is the most famous person in Finland. Well, who was second, right? And it was just, it just, just that innocently. There, we knew there had to be, and then we'd go and try to see if we could find something out. Well, if Oscar Niemeyer could build Utopia because we were looking at a book on Oscar Niemeyer we bought, they wouldn't import all the design. They would have to have local talent that would rival the architecture of what we were seeing. And that's what led us to start to ask about, and ask, we just started to ask everybody if they had a connection to Brazil. And literally that's how it happened. We did as someone that was American who was married to a Brazilian and was living here for half the year and living in Brazil for half the year, comes back about a year later and brings up a container of stuff that she could sell to us out of nowhere. And we didn't know what anything is. She didn't really know what most things were. And um, the same thing again, went and spent all the money that day with them there of what they had. And sure enough, we put the work out like in the middle of the gallery that we get. Um, upstairs here, and then as people started to come in, we started to ask them, well, do you, you know what this is? Do you know where it's from? And the, everybody was guessing from everywhere. Then we knew we'd stumbled upon something. And they were interested in it, they liked it, they were instantly attracted. All the different types of tastemakers wanted it. And it then, checked all the, all the boxes in the same way our early exhibitions here did, where you know, these were designers that most people in America had never heard of before, because mm-hmm. Brazilian design was never exported. But yet it held up. It was equally as sophisticated and beautiful and well-crafted and out of the most gorgeous, rare woods. Um, so people were curious. Um, and again, we didn't just settle on buying those pieces from those um, friends of ours. We got on a plane and we went to Brazil. We would only ever found three pictures in overview books that would say like, and it would be a two by two inch picture from an overview like yearbook of design in 1952 or something that would say, Joaquim Tinheiro, Rio de Janeiro, and nothing more. Yeah. And we had one picture of a Sergio Rodriguez piece. And it was just mind blowing when we, ev- everywhere we went like this at this time, every single thing we did, if it was more singular or, we had no idea that Brazil would be this fruitful. We, how could we have, right? We had no literature. We knew we needed to, kind of set the record straight. I think that's partly why we go back to the books again and collecting books. And all this while we're talking, we're collecting books everywhere we go. When we're in Finland, when we're in Scandinavia, when we're in Germany, when we're in Amsterdam, when we're in Brazil, we're, we're going to those antique shops and bookstores and buying whatever catalogs we can find that, and bringing them back here um, and studying them. And, but at that time there was such a freewheeling, you know, market before the internet, this is still pre-internet or very, very early internet, where 
people could tell you whatever they wanted about a thing. Mm-hmm. Like this is uh, uh, attributed to Greta Grossman. And, you know, is it really? How do you know that? I mean, there was no, I didn't see that in any books. So this was happening ever. So we set out to try to find the answer. Is it really Greta Grossman? Is it really what someone was telling us? And, and, and that was also how we were able to uh, say, well, it is in fact, here it is, here's the proof. And this is why it's now what we're selling it for. And you hold these uh, Brazilian designers as the top five designers of the 20th uh, century, I read somewhere. Uh, not, not quite that. I mean, they're, they're, they're really <laughs> it's good. It's a very they're, sensitive uh, question, uh, of course. Who said that? I don't know if that's the way the quote actually <laughs> yeah, reads. But, but um, no, there's like, so Joaquim Tenhero, this is a Tenhero chair that you're looking at. He was a master wood carver himself. And he could, and if we showed you his body of work, it's extreme and goes on for a good 30 years of these amazing, insane details, understanding the material, pushing the material. He actually carved the wood himself. He was a master carver. Most of the other people we recognize in the industry were either architects or designers. They weren't the carvers themselves. And so um, he, and, but so then it begs the question, well, why didn't the rest of the world know about him? Right, because that's what you'd want to find out. Like, how come? And what we learned from doing the research in the same way that we would do it anywhere else mm. is it was against the law to export from Brazil. That's why we had no pictures in these books. So during military rule and dictatorship, it was illegal. As Brazil changes in the later 80s, um, then everything opened up, but you still couldn't obtain an export license. That's why the work never came out. The world needs Brazil. Brazil never needed the world. What we did come to realize and how we would become more fruitful is then, so why was this structure of detail there? Where did these people come from? And why would that become so important to us? Well, uh, Brazil or South America as the Americas to in, in North America as well, have a lot of the same waves of immigration. Uh, Mies van der Rohe had an opportunity in America, but maybe his colleague had an opportunity in Brazil. Mm-hmm. They came with the education. So the, the, the younger sons and daughters came educated in a classical European way, but on their left and the right of them was the mother coming with the recipes at the time and the father coming with the hand skill. And this is why um, these other countries, when you look at the cities or architecture and other such projects from these countries are so sophisticated or interesting and that pushes past what they've learned because of what they were able to have as a local material. Brazil was the perfect sort of um, you know, test case in a way because you had this uh, in, you know, invaluable resource of material you had very sophisticated clientele. You had the, the, the skills of the craftsmen coming from both indigenous and from influxing from in Europe and other places. And then, and then you had modernism. Um, and you had, on top of all that, wealth. So you put all that together and you have the perfect recipe for an incredible uh, industry. Um, and modernism exploded there. And it's such a massive continent that, uh, you know, we've really just scratched the surface. How did the, the Scandinavian arm of your business develop? You had a Swedish partner. I, I read somewhere that you had a 40-foot container with Scandinavian furniture for under $10,000. How, how did the Scandinavian thing? You just you, you went to Finland, I heard that. Well, from baking glass, we met someone who, was in, who grew up in Sweden. His mother turned out to be selling antiques in Scandinavia <laughs> for 40 years. They um, lived in Malmo. So um, obviously they would do the fairs in Denmark as they would in Sweden. Um, and we would uh, take the ferry across, um, which was awesome, being able to take the ferry back and forth as you, it seems like you know all too well. And um, we would just go there and this is where we would do the same thing. We just, we would go to the ants or in England, the Salvation Armies. Um, and we would have to sometimes pick or choose. Do you want to take the Hans Wegner or the Finn Yule or the Janne Oxen? Because we would run out of space when we first started to do it. And then we would look at it, and the, these things were just there in the same way. We would read the classified papers, the blue paper, I think it was called in Denmark at the time, 
and people would be selling, uh, have to deaccession all the Paul Hennison lamps from this corporate headquarters, and they would have 40 Paul Hennison lamps that we would go and buy, yeah. and things like this would just keep happening the same way. Yeah. It was that right moment of time. You bought, actually, the um, estate of Greta Magnusson Grossman. She left Sweden at an early age. Uh, uh, is that well, correct? Well, she wasn't that young, but it was before um, modernism became so popular. Mm -hmm. um, so most Swedes didn't know Greta Magnusson Grossman. Um, so I was surprised by that myself, because we did start to investigate Greta many, many years ago, as early, we did our first show in 2000 mm. on Greta. And at that time, um, I was spending a lot of time in Los Angeles and had discovered and met a man named Julius Schulman, the photographer who shot all the famous case study houses and all the famous architects in Los Angeles and Southern California. And um, at that time, I had been interested in Greta Grossman because another dealer had been showing her work here, and I had never heard of her in the same way. And I was fascinated by the work, and we were fascinated by the work. And we, I started, started asking questions around L.A. and um, was introduced to Julie Schulman, who introduced me to an architect named Pierre Koenig, one of the most famous architects of the Case Study House program. And at this time, I didn't know, no one knew if a, Greta was even alive or dead, but I heard she had this house up in the hills. Um, turns out Julie Schulman had photographed all of her work, um, throughout most of her California period and um, was so intrigued because by me coming and asking about Greta, he almost came to tears because no one had asked about her in 40 years. So all of the archives of his, of her career, were stored in what he called the retired files, which were the things no one ever asked about. And those were in, stored in his bathroom. <laughs> so I started going out there regularly and digging through all his archives and going through all these things. And that's what prompted us to do this first exhibition in 2000 was using all the material we got from Schulman, all those original photos. And up till that point, no one had ever even seen these images of her architecture. We knew of her furniture and a few lamps, but turns out she was a very successful architect. And in many cases, like the first woman to get a degree in architecture, the first woman to get a contract to do you know, all these sorts of things. Every issue of Arts and Architecture magazine we started to, started to buy, you know, at the antique shops in, in L.A. And lo and behold, there she is again. Full page stories, one after the next, one after the next. I couldn't believe it. That uh, led us to, you know, this exhibition. Eventually, um, while doing the research for that exhibition, I met her stepdaughter, mm -hmm. who was still living um, in uh, San Diego. And uh, she... Basically, through her lawyer, I got her information and another six years of trying to visit her and talking to her. Eventually, she called and said, come and see, you know, you can come see the collection. We ended up buying the estate uh, of Greta from the stepdaughter. Uh, and that's when the entire bigger story unfolds of Greta's career, because up to that point, we didn't really know her time in Sweden and all the other great success she had had there. So from that point, we started thinking about a bigger exhibition on Greta now that we had this archive of all her original drawings, all her press books, all her archives, hmm. prototypes, everything, photographs. And um, I met a woman from Sweden who was the curator at the Architecture Musette, which unfortunately no longer exists, which was on the island right next to the National Museum mm -hmm. um, in Stockholm. We ended up working together and producing this exhibition in 2010 um, mm -hmm. called A Car and Get a, Get a Magnuson Grossman, A Car and Some Shorts. And we opened in Stockholm this massive exhibition, which took two to three years to organize. Um, and lo and behold, the Swedes had never even heard of her. No. I was shocked, mm -hmm. except for outside of a few curators. Um, someone from the National Museum had, because she had done a show there in the 1930s, they had a little entry in a, in a book somewhere about her, but they, they didn't know anything. Is that incredible? 
And um, so we, it was a real eye opener. Coming back to, to the term collectible design, you mentioned in some of the articles that I read that um, there was a tipping point in 2004 uh, at the, in Miami where there was an exhibition of design where the art collecting came into the design area. Can you explain that a little bit, how, how that tipping point happened? Art Basel had, had moved to Miami for its first iteration in 2003 or four. We knew of a man named Craig Robbins, who we didn't know so well, and Evan still has a copy of the letter saying, we think you should do a design fair because this is going to really happen and you own the design district kind of thing. And Craig invited us down there to create uh, what became Design Miami. He is a huge real estate developer and huge art collector. And we had met him through another friend of ours, um, Terrence Riley, who was then at the MoMA, who's no longer, who passed away last year, uh, and his partner John Keenan, who were architects, and they were building a building for Craig at the time. In the we design done, district. We had done a Paul Kierholm exhibition here in the gallery with John Keenan, and that's how we sort of got to know. So he had recommended us or introduced us to Craig. Oh, he was doing Craig's apartment, our house at the and, time, and too. And he said, you guys should meet Craig. Craig owns these buildings in Miami and, you know, is into design and into art. So we wrote him this letter with this idea, you know, hey, we think design has a place in alongside this art fair. And we had done a show in Paris a couple years earlier, which was the first time I think collectible design really came together. Mm -hmm. And it was at the Carousel du Louvre. And this was organized by a woman who did a photography show, which I can't remember. And at the time, this was the first time I saw high-level galleries put together in, in a fair situation. Up till then, there were these rinky-dink kind of modernism shows around the world but, and flea markets and things like that. But there was never a focused, curated group of dealers in one place. Mm. And this had happened in Paris. And this was sort of what the impetus of, I think, this Miami idea was, well, let's do this in Miami. We know so many dealers in America and in Europe and in other parts of the world that we think would be interested. We could help bring them in. We can call all our friends. We can make them do the best thing they could ever do. And they all have you know, their own unique takes on modernism. And that's where it started. When that opening happened that December, I, I couldn't speak by the end of it. We, there was, I, I'd never lost my voice before. We have, must have had tens of thousands of people had passed our booths. We didn't sell a single thing. We sold zero <laughs> and knew we'd found the moment. <laughs> yeah, we didn't we, sell one single thing that, nope. whole, that first year. But Not, you no, knew. We knew. That the tidal wave had all sort of. There was an energy there. There was something that was, you know, different. We knew, we knew this was going to blow up to a, something we couldn't imagine. And sure enough, within the next, as the next year or two goes on, we, it, our whole industry starts to, it takes off as collectible design. It takes off that the art collectors want in on this. They want to put something more interesting um, to look at their art with or sit around or have the illuminated sculpture above their head that helps the place instead of challenges the dwelling. I also see that this is where contemporary design starts to come into play. So there were contemporary galleries prior to that, probably, but, but this was the first time people saw, you know, this idea of like limited edition contemporary pieces being done by designers um, that like, were specialized. Like the Ron Arid and the Mark Newsons of the time, they, they were the height of the market. Studio Yobe was the younger coming up at the time. You had these British companies, it was mostly European, Mm -hmm. There was not an American gallery really representing contemporary so much. Uh, this is a very European thing because this is what Europe knows, the idea of the designer and the craftsman as being two separate worlds. Um, America, that worked very differently. But that, uh, you know, people start to pay attention. This is Zaha Hadid's moment where Zaha Hadid starts to come to these events with these pieces of furniture that were editions that were $100,000 and sold out. No one had ever heard of such a thing. And all of a sudden, the things, the, the wheels start to turn. Um, that really was, I think, that, that's the tipping point, uh, or the first tipping point. I think there's several more to come. You mentioned in the beginning of, of this conversation that you, you were working with artists, uh, contemporary artists. Did that come out of the Miami uh, experience, or was that some parallel track that was always there to some Pushed extent? Pushed us. 
to do more. I mean, we were already showing Jeff Zimmerman's work and we showed Jeff Zimmerman at the first Design Miami as well. When he came to us and said, oh, can you guys show uh, my artwork? And we did, and he dropped some stuff off and we put it in the window. We had had phone calls left on our voicemail overnight of people wanting to buy the work, which was just blew us out of the water. And of course, what happens to any market that's historical is it gets harder and harder over time to keep acquiring works if it's being repopulated as a secondary sale, right? And, and as the prices are hopefully elevating. So you have two things always going against you. It costs more money to get the next one and there's less of it out there. So not that we were stopping what we were doing because we were still diving into historical, but we realized that we could grow a program and make it more interesting and put the two worlds together. And could we get our clientele to take the journey with us? But at first we didn't even really, I think, believe it ourselves because we were looking to other partnerships and other galleries to um, maybe validate what we were trying to do. So, for instance, we set up, you know, Jeff had his first real big exhibition with Emmanuel Paratin in Paris. And that was like the first um, time people had seen his work outside of being a glass uh, object, but as a sculpture. Um, we then did a similar exhibition with the Sean Kelly Gallery with Jeff Zimmerman. So we set Jeff up and introduced him into this art world and then brought him back into the fold. And that sort of became a little bit of a model for us in terms of how we started to create um, careers for people. And thinking about using the art world, because that's the only model we could sort of find, as a way to, to show and talk and display these younger or contemporary people, essentially taking what was a, a functional object, but then displaying it as a work of art. That's what we did, and that's what we still do today. But that's a very different uh, role then, uh, to, to provide a career for an artist uh, over a longer period of time. How did, how, did you, how did you think about that in terms of your resources and your, your organization? And uh... We had to grow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it had, it had to grow to support. Yeah, uh, and it still has to grow to support. That's the, always the hardest thing with working with living people that have keep having ideas. You know, we we take it for granted, but it's really hard for people to have more than one great idea. And when you start representing them, it would be great if they all sort of wanted to go in the same direction, but they never do, right? Um, so you have to be willing then to take your time and resources to go figure out how to get them over to the left and then get them over to the right and get them back into the middle. <laughs> and so all these things will hopefully come together. And it's a, it's a lot, it's, the work is much harder, um, you know, um, and, and, but that's what we've taken on to do. And, and by being able to do that, then we, we get to create, we become the storytellers. We get to create the stories for them, with them. We have a level of responsibility because we've talked about presentation in the same way of as we take on these responsibilities is also how we deliver it to uh, the client, to uh, the other parts of the public that are just as important. The enthusiast plays a huge role here that people underestimate um, to get us to the client, to create the fan base and to the artist himself or designer who is our client in this case. That time we used to spend traveling to Brazil or to Europe or to other parts of the world to discover things is now spent traveling to artist studios and talking to them about their work and still discovering things. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just a shift. And now we're still, of course, continuing in our work in the historical uh, realm. But more and more we're finding that the time does get eaten up with the contemporary programs because it does take a lot more manpower it takes a lot more time it takes a lot more effort um, than buying something and selling it now you're now you're actually trying to build something and you have to communicate with a living artist and and you have their desires and their needs mm -hmm. that you have to fulfill as much as you have to fulfill your own one of the things we uniquely do that most of the design galleries in the world don't do is one we have a historical and contemporary program which almost nobody else does but on top of that we're not nationalistic and we're not stylistic we represent design now from five different continents on purpose so we can storytell in a bigger way of, and, we, and I mentioned it before with the idea of how things immigrated, migrated. How did these synergies happen or, and why? I was thinking about the, the dynamic between the two of you. Who does what in this partnership? I mean, we've worked together for almost 30 years now, I guess, or more than 30, which is hard to believe. And, the, you know, like any partnership, there's 
highs and lows, and we've been through tough times and good times, and we've made it through pandemics and 2001 and and recessions and all these sorts of things. Um, but over the course of all this time, uh, we have managed to sort of find our own specialties within the business and and know found the things that that we're each good at individually, um, but also learning to um, you know take a lot of chances. And um, in the end, we don't always see things eye to eye, but when we get to the en- at the at the end of the day, uh, we have the same goals, and we have the same ethic, and we have the same um, sort of vision. Our visions have always seemed to align, even when we're the furthest apart on ideas of how something might or should be or run. It sort of is shocking sometimes to me that when we come back to it without even speaking to one another, we somehow arrive at the same place. So what is that constant then? It's the same as the B team. You know, it's, it's, it's pushing people of how to see, being able to give back at the same time that you take and being able to keep creating the next and to keep carrying on as people value what we've already done. We built White Street in a way because we wanted to challenge the conventions that retail has to exist in the 21st century, especially in a city like New York. And it's so important that people get together and go and discover. So that, for us, is a space to discover. That is our masterwork. That is our palace. That's our castle. Mm -hmm. We don't need more than that. And there we can get people to dream and we can present in a way that becomes incredible. And we can rival um, even what some institutions can do because of our scale of space, because of the chance we took. We did this this great project um, in 2020 called Objects USA, which was a passion project, which spent you know three years of hard work on this exhibition of during the pandemic, throughout the pandemic, going and trying to uncover all these great stories of the American craft movement, the American studio movement, um, which is one of, I think, my most ex- most passionate projects because there's so much to discover and so much to uncover. And um, so that, we're just at the beginning of this project, which has a lot more um, life in it, that we're beginning to talk about traveling, we're beginning to talk about new uh, iterations of this project. So this is, the for, for the foreseeable future, going to be an overlaying project that will be ongoing. It's the perfect fit for, for our and company's brand because it's the marriage of, of fine art and design or fine art and craft, however you want to define it. Listeners can go and see uh, your favorite uh, designers uh, on exhibition at uh, the White Street yes. right now. Um, with um, Katie Stout, Zanini de Zanini, and Jeff Zimmerman. Yeah, oh, Zanini de Zanini. For the Brazilian, the young Brazilian having his first show with us. Through April 22nd. Through April 22nd. And what happens after that? <laughs> well, we have our, uh, well, our spring roster. We have a series of exhibitions opening April 28th. Um, we're opening uh, the first solo show of uh, Serban Ionescu, who's a Romanian-born architect and furniture designer, who's taking over what we call the Air Gallery, building a 22-foot-tall steel architectural folly within the gallery, which is pretty incredible. Um, it's also a show, we're showing the work of um, Han Chung Lee, who's a contemporary Korean ceramicist who we've worked to, worked for, with for many, many years. But uh, Hun Chung has not had an exhibition with us for um, eight or close to ten years. He has recently moved to Los Angeles, and we built this entire studio there with him, and we're building this incredible exhibition together. And then a new artist, a um, very young artist, who's still a student at Alfred University named Joe Lee No. Um, so three very different artists, three very different parts of their careers. Actually, it's the sort of early, mid, and, and established artists. Um, so this is very exciting for us, this, this group of exhibitions. Summer, we have three or four um, exhibitions planned um, outside of the gallery. Uh, and then in the fall, we have another um, one of our major artists, um, Rogan Gregory, opening in the gallery. This will be his second or third show with us. Well, Evan and Saisti, thank you so much for sharing your story and uh, your wonderful achievement and uh, this beautiful gallery. Uh, It's been a real treat. Uh, Thank you so much for taking the time. 
Thank you. And, Thank um, you. I wish that all, the, all our listeners could come and, and visit your exhibition. It's 64 White Street in Tribeca. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. This Thank was you. really fun. Thank you. This is Art Insiders New York, and my name is Anders Holst. If you enjoyed this episode and have family and friends who love New York and are passionate about the world of art design and architecture, please spread the word by following us on artinsidersnewyork.com or liking us on our Facebook page, Art Insiders New York, where we publish newsworthy material all the time. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. This episode was produced by UOM LLC, copyright 2022.